Major Mark Breslau is a veteran of over 20 years in the military service. Growing up in a military family, it was his destiny to join. I was born here in Southern California, over the San Fernando Valley. Actually, I was born in, uh, in Santa Monica in 1951. And do you have any, like, any, any relatives in the military, any other parents? Or... No, my dad served in the, uh, in the Army Air Corps in World War II. My brother served in the Air Force during Vietnam, but he never went to Vietnam. Uh, my daughter is a major currently serving in the Pentagon. My son-in-law is a captain who is going to Georgetown University right now and then will serve in the Pentagon. My son is a captain in the Army Reserve. He's been on four combat tours in the Middle East. My wife served with the California National Guard as a warrant officer. The whole family is all military. After college, Mr. Breslau ended up joining the Army. I actually wanted to join the Navy originally. I like their uniforms better. But uh, I have several vision deficiencies that disqualified me to be a Naval officer. I didn't uh, have the acuity and the sight that they required. I couldn't be in the Air Force for the same reason. Uh, in order to be a Marine officer, you had to go through the Navy program, so that knocked the Marine Corps out, which left only the Army. And actually, I thought it was a good decision. Mr. Breslau also explained to us the mindset of a soldier and why they would want to go to war. Let me explain, in a sense you might be able to understand, uh, a soldier's view of war. It's like a fireman's view of fire. We train to stop something that is catastrophic, like a fireman trains to stop a fire. But when the fire starts, there's no place a fireman wants to be more than at the fire to do what he's supposed to do. The same thing with a soldier. If there's going to be a war, I've trained for this war, I want to go. Because that's what I am here for. I don't want to sit back and watch everybody else go. So that's the sense of when war occurs, why soldiers end up saying, hey, I want to go. My first assignment was overseas. I went to Korea. In 1974, it was a much different place. The transition to military life wasn't hard for Mr. Breslau because he grew up in a military family. But the transition from living in America to living in Korea was a new experience for him. The Asian lifestyle here in the United States is nothing like the Asian lifestyle in Asia. Totally different thing. There are things that are better procured on the economy, out in the Korean marketplace. Uh, the traffic was different, the food was different. You don't go out to a hamburger joint, there were none. There were no McDonald's, there were no Kentucky Fried Chicken. Mr. Breslau's second operation was as a UN peacekeeper in Lebanon. Then he served as a U.S. Army Central Command G6 Operations Officer in Operation Desert Storm, which was an operation to get Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, out of Kuwait. Uh, these are the orders to Saudi Arabia. This is where we went into Desert Storm. They had about uh, a thousand people living in that gym on cots. And you would report there, and then they would go ahead and give you an assignment, and you would catch a vehicle and have it out where you're supposed to go. Out at one of the encampments, that's what it looked like. Just tents out in the desert. <clears throat> this was the compound that we were working out of, called Escon Village. Uh, it was a uh, not a difficult experience. Desert Storm was a brief operation from January 1991 to April of the same year. It consisted of an Allied coalition made up of 39 countries, including the U.S. The Allied coalition consisted of 670,000 troops from 28 countries. About 425,000 of the troops were from the U.S., with a total of 383 U.S. fatalities and 100,000 Iraqi soldier fatalities. The operation was a success and ended with Kuwait liberated. After Desert Storm, Mr. Breslau went to Bosnia as the 7th Signal Brigade Deputy Commander on peacekeeping duties. We went into Bosnia at that time at peacekeeping duties there because uh, Yugoslavia fell apart and they were fighting each other. And uh, President Clinton arranged for a ceasefire and we went in to go ahead and control the ceasefire. So this is Zagreb, where headquarters was, 
and uh, the people in Croatia were upset with the UN and what they would do is they would build this wall around UN headquarters with a brick with the name of every Croatian that was being killed in this, this civil war that was going on. This is where I live. This is the area of our compound. It was a wrecked uh, Croatian air base oh, by the way, that we were using. And you can see some of the areas that we were working in. We were working you know, 12, 14 hours a day. We, our job was to put in communications to support those people who were the peacekeepers that were on the front lines to keep the two sides from shooting at each other. My primary job at this time was not to go ahead and do communications in the forward area in Croatia. <coughs> My job was to run all the communications back in Germany. So I had the rear detachment and half the communications that were being deployed at the time was under my control. After Bosnia, Mr. Breslau briefly retired but was called back to active duty for the war and terrorism in Iraq. There he was the Deputy Secretary of the Combined and Joint Staff and was part of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Its goal was to create a stable Iraq that doesn't support terrorism, threaten its neighbors, or participate in weapons of mass destruction development. Mr. Breslau told us a little anecdote of his experience there. By the time I went to Iraq, I'd been in the Army for 26 years. So I was pretty much attuned to all of the different environments. In Iraq, you were locked on the compound. If you went off the compound, it was in a convoy with gun trucks. You were armed to the teeth. Any time I left the compound, I was carrying a 9mm, and I'd go in and get an M4 or an M16 and pack in probably 100 rounds of ammunition. And I didn't leave the compound all that often. I left maybe four or five times in the year that I was there to go do other business or other missions. You were always a target if you were off the compound. One of the incidences you had is if you are moving on, a, on an Iraqi road, you don't stop. So we're running down the Iraqi road. I was in a convoy with a two-star general. I was one of his uh, uh, staff. So I was going with him over from the headquarters area at, uh, at Camp Victory into the green zone into downtown Baghdad. And we're running down a highway and suddenly traffic stops. And our driver, he ain't stopping. He weaves through the traffic, crosses over the median, hits the other side of the highway and is going into oncoming traffic. Oncoming traffic getting out of the way as our little convoy is running down there until traffic on that side stops and he goes back over into the median and on the other side where we run into an MP checkpoint, US MPs. And they were stopping everybody. We pulled over, stopped because we were now in a controlled area and found out there was an IED just up the road and they had stopped traffic to clear the IED. So those are, are some of the differences that you have. Later, Mr. Breslau told us about how he communicated with family and friends during his service. When I was in Korea overseas in that, that peacetime civilian environment, uh, you could go ahead and get access through certain telephones on the compound. You go ahead and apply for time to go ahead and make a phone call. I could call my dad and talk to him or Alice and call her parents. In Desert Storm, when I was over there for three months, I would have to find a phone that had international access. We were in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh. And I did. I found one phone that had international access. And I could dial a number and I could go dial my wife and, and talk to her. And I would talk to her maybe even once every couple of weeks. Let her know that everything was okay. In Desert Storm, I wrote letters. Uh, in Korea, I wrote letters to my parents but not a whole lot. I also had my Apple laptop computer. And I purchased at, uh, it was about $7 a month to get Wi-Fi access from my little hooch, hooch is a term for your right, kind of group. Okay. Uh, but then in the morning, when everybody wasn't up, I'd get up early enough because I had to be in early, that I could Skype with my wife and get a video picture of her for about week. Over 20 years of military service gave Mr. Breslau a lot of valuable life lessons. Tolerance, dealing with people, how to deal with people, because what a lot of people don't understand is in the Army at any rate, we have to deal with people because our main instrument of combat 
are soldiers. In the Navy, the main instrument of combat is some machinery run by sailors, but it's the machinery that is your main weapon system. And each individual there is just another part of that machinery. In the Army, the machinery is the soldier. And the biggest machine we have is what, a tank with five guys in it. So how to deal with people, uh, how to focus, how to establish goals and achieve them. All of those things are critical elements of living within the military and ensuring that you don't fail. Because if you think about what happens if the American military fails. What happens? Yeah, you're all in danger. So you cannot afford to fail. Because that puts the nation at risk. So those things, uh, how to be tolerant of people. How to assess yourself, because we all are going to be failures at some point in time, in some way. Uh, in dealing with other people, everything doesn't always go well. And who do you blame if something goes wrong? Most people don't. Most people blame the other person. If something goes wrong with us, it's your fault, name my fault. That's a life lesson, to be able to introspect in relations with other people and determine where you are wrong and where they may be right. To go ahead and analyze your situation. It took me a long time to realize that everything that went bad in my life was not my wife's fault. Okay, A lot of it was my fault and I had to go ahead and take ownership of what I had done to make a difficult situation worse. So those are some things that the Army will teach you, the military will teach you that. You have to introspect, you have to think things through. Because teamwork is a major element of what we do. You've got to work with them. We're very thankful that Mr. Breslau had agreed to have an interview with us. It was truly an enlightening experience and we won't forget this anytime soon.